Lord Desai uh, doesn't need much of an introduction. Uh, he's an internationally, internationally known economist, uh, social scientist, political thinker. He graduated uh, from the Bombay University. Not graduated, he took master's degree, sir, in the, from Bombay. Then he went uh, to an American, two American universities. The second one was uh, the Berkeley University. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, after that, he joined the London School of Economics. And there he was for how many years? Several decades, I think. <laughs> Uh, he retired, I think, in 2003. Uh, he is a member of the House of Lords, uh, which is a position of very high distinction. Uh, but he hasn't forgotten his Indian roots. He hasn't forgotten India. Most of you, or some of you at least, uh, would have been reading his commentaries on Indian politics, Indian election processes, the things that are happening now. I read him uh, uh, always, the first thing, when I open my newspaper in the morning, Indian Express in particular. Uh, I think if our policy makers, our government, take careful note of what he has been saying and implement some of the suggestions that he has been giving us for a good uh, quality, good governments, honest government, uh, India will be a very diff different country. The subject that I wrote to him, uh, telling him that we, Satyasai International Centre, uh, this centre was established by Bhagavan Sri Satyasai Baba himself, it was inaugurated in the presence of the then Prime Minister of India, Mr. Vajpayee. Uh, the task that he gave us was to, not to propagate, but to get India, Indians and the world generally to know what good life, good governments, good society, good state uh, comes about, how it comes about, what is needed. The answer he himself uh, gave to this problem was to have a good family, a good society, a good country, you need to follow certain ethical, moral values. In his summing up of this, those values are Satya, Dharma, Shanti, Prem, Non-Violence, Truth, uh, Righteousness, uh, Peace, Non-Violence, above all, Love. If there is love in the human heart, then everything falls in line. And all this put together uh, for in, in terms of social behavior or individual behavior means what? Love all, serve all. Love and service. That is the core of the teaching of our master. Uh, when I wrote to Lord Asai, he wrote back to say, uh, I am not if the follower of any particular guru or mentor. And uh, his uh, biodata has one paragraph of one line which says, I am an atheist. I said to myself, well, he's an atheist, then maybe there is still some hope. Lord Desai, things could change. I have seen atheists come to Satya Sai Baba in Puttaparthi, the ashram, not go back as believers, but deeply impressed by the system of values uh, which uh, he was trying to uh, communicate to, uh, to whoever wanted to listen to him or was willing to listen to him. Now, uh, in our country, from times immemorial, Vedic times, saints and seers, they have uh, given us these values. Vedantic philosophy, the same values. 
uh, subsequent thinkers, Shankaracharya, and a whole series of them, the uh, reincarnations, uh, the avatars, as we call them, they have preached the same values. But in our country today, it does not appear that either the government of the day or the society in general uh, is following those values and therefore you have these, you know, cases of corruption running into hundreds, lakhs of, cro lakhs of uh, uh, crores of uh, rupees. If that ill-gotten wealth was spent for public purposes, this country would be in a very different situation. Now, uh, what is the subject uh, 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 then he, I had asked him, I said, all right, you, uh, tell us the subject you would like to speak to. He said, the subject should be, why is there no public morality in India? Now, this doesn't mean that there never was public morality in India. We have glorious periods uh, uh, in our uh, social and political history, the reign of Ashoka, for example, earlier the Gupta period earlier period still, or even in later days, the time of Akbar, for example, they attempt to uh, transcend attachment to a particular religion, and he tried to synthesize uh, the uh, religions that were available to him at the time, Islam, Hinduism, there were some Christians around too, uh, called deen e -Ilahi. the values, the what is morality? Morality is a system of uh, certain values, certain principles. And the values and principles uh, are ingrown. This country is not without human beings, men and women of great piety, great honesty, great sense of morality. But somehow, in the collectivity, something, somewhere, goes wrong. I hope the, uh, the, what we see today is a passing phenomena. Now, uh, Lord Desai will speak to us uh, what is wrong, and I, uh, that will at least tell us what is wrong. Once we know what is wrong, then I think the process begins of setting things right. I hope, sir, at the end of your talk, you will also tell us what the cure is for the malaise from which our society, our governance presently uh, suffers. May I request you, Lord Desai, to address us. Thank you very much, uh, dear Excellency, uh, and uh, thank you for inviting me here. Thank you all for coming on a, on a hot and later a rainy day. Uh, I always say that when I speak, I don't want my audience to go away happy. <laughs> I don't think I've come to make you happy. I've come to get you agitated and thinking and perhaps angry, angry with me, at least. And so I would say to begin with that perhaps what I may say you may not like. But please ask questions and come back to me with criticism after I have finished. So I will not give a Fidel Castro three and a half hour speech. It will, it will be like an academic lecture I'm used to giving, which is what, 50 minutes, 50 to 55 minutes. Okay. Now, what is the problem? Uh, and I think uh, this excellence is a very good introduction to what, what the problem is. We have no lack of deeply religious people. We have, I think, no lack of piety. But at least in public life, there is clearly a feeling that there is no morality. I don't want to just go into the narrow thing about corruption, which is involved with money making, rent seeking, whatever it is. And that is part of it. But for me, the most remarkable thing is that. Uh, Maybe since Lal Bhattar Shastri resigned uh, as railway minister okay, back in the 1950s, uh, there is a great reluctance on part of people in public 
to suffer the consequences of their own actions. It's very interesting. As, as when I, when this uh, invitation came, I was just reading about Ashok Chavan and how Ashok Chavan had been named in the Adarsh report. And Rahul Gandhi, of course, was going to be very tough on corruption and all that, not give anybody a seat, but then he finally got a seat. And the argument was, he may have been named in Adarsh report, but he hasn't actually been convicted of anything yet. The same argument made of Pawan Kumar Bansal. The same argument could be made on the other side of the Europe or in whoever it is. So I think, isn't it interesting that now you've come to a stage in Indian public life where nobody can be faulted for anything they have done, although it may be <coughs> general knowledge, until a court of law actually not only convicts him, but puts him in jail so he cannot take part in political life. There are inner criminals in Parliament, inner people who have not yet quite finished their journey to the courts, and they're still out on bail or something like that. And it, it's very, very, you can do whatever you like. There can be no public disapprobation at all. You will not be shunned by your friends or even your enemies. You, you, you can do whatever you like until somehow a, a legal system which indeed is not native to India. Okay, it may be here for 200 years, but it is not native to India. Until the legal system actually goes with the usual delays of days and years, finally puts you into jail, and you're not allowed to get out, like Lalu Prasad Yadav was able to get out. That's when you stop. Now, the question is, is this is there something systematic happening here? And can we somehow connect it to the deeper questions of, of morality and so on? And I'm going, to, I'm going to sort of venture myself into this dangerous territory. And I have sort of come to the conclusion, actually I'm throwing the hypothesis, that uh, in, and I'm mainly going to talk about Hindus, you know, I'm not going to get into other religions because you know, Let's, let's take two hundred million. Uh, I think there is a notion that if action has consequences, the consequences of action do not relate to the actor. Therefore, you are not responsible for the consequences of your action. Okay. Now, in a sense, that that is a. I've just written a somewhat uh, controversial book on the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, it's called Who Wrote the Bhagavad Gita? Uh, and reading the Bhagavad Gita at a rather late age in my life, I hadn't read it till I was 70, I finally read it. And it struck me that it's a, it, it's a text which people frequently cite. Karman Nevari, Kalasay, Mahathalit, Shukadaj. I don't think very many people read it, but that, that's another story. And I find that there are three different uh, doctrines of action and consequences. If you have a bit of patience, I'll take you through them. We know the scene. There is this great warrior who has a nervous breakdown, as it were, facing this. After he knew what he was coming for, he'd come in, suddenly saw his relations crossing. Don't want to kill. He said, "No virtue in killing. It nothing. Kulanaas will, you know, Kulanaas will lead to horrible consequences, etc. I'm not going to kill." So then we have a series of uh, 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 adhyayas later on, and I think the core argument uh, of the Bhagavad Gita happens in the second adhyay. After that, there's other other issues. The, the argument relating to what Karim <coughs> should do in the current situation of crisis that he faces. The first argument from about 10th shlok of 2nd Adhyay onwards is that you do not kill. Nobody is killed, the soul is eternal. 
and whatever happens, the pandita, the pandits do not worry about coming and going of people. You do not kill, you are not killed, you, you know, you have never lived nor you have ever died. Therefore, agency is agency has no consequence. The real life is not this life. The real life is out there. This is delusion. So whatever you do here has no actual physical or uh, real meaning. You may think it has a meaning, but it's an illusion. You do not kill. I, I, should, I should say parenthetically that Ambedkar uh, remarked that if any lawyer gave this argument in a court of law, he'd be sent off the lunatic asylum. But then Ambedkar didn't like the Bhagavad Gita very much. He said the idea that you don't kill, you, know, you may have killed somebody, but he said, but, 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 but your honor, I've not murdered him because his soul still lives. Uh, I think you know, that, that will not count. But, anyway. but to me, the interesting thing is what I call it is a uh, irrelevance of agency. Whatever you do has no consequence, but you can do anything about it. Now, if you do something, you are a passive instrument of a vast uh, sort of uh, process. Mm -hmm which goes on without consulting you, without knowing who you are, because you are part of a big, big grid. And therefore, forget, forget the ego in you. You, you. You're just doing nothing. You, you're, just a, you're just a walk on part. Uh, so action is no consequences. Then a little bit further on, uh, 31 to 38, uh, Krishna changes uh, the tact. And so, you know, you say that killing is adharma. That's what Arjun said. And Krishna says, no, no, killing is swadharma. As a kshatriya, it is your duty to kill. You, know, you were born, you were born to, as it were, ultimately die on a, on a, on a field of war. And therefore, uh, your caste duty the duty predicted by your caste, your caste status, your kshatriya status, is that you kill. You can't run away from this. This is your fate. This is, this is your, your, your ontological uh, thing, that you do not think that you are just an ordinary human being who has a choice of killing or not killing. You are preordained. Therefore, if you kill, it will not be any mark against you. You kill, it's natural. If you don't kill, people will say you're a coward. And your opponents will give you no marks for nobility. They'll say you're a coward, you ran away because you're going to lose. Now, if you kill, there are two consequences. Either you will live and win and enjoy this life, or you will die and go to heaven. So it's an each way bet. You can't lose. Therefore, you may as well go and fight. So here is the two theories of action. One which says that action is no consequence because you, you're not the actor. You're just a little cog in the machine. And another story is that uh, your actions are determined by your status in the social structure. And there, there's a story, I think, in uh, one of the collections of, uh, not Panchala, but some other stories about this uh, this man who, uh, this sort of bhikshu who comes to the king and he says, who is the noble person in your land? Uh, and the king says, well, I am certainly not noble because as a king, I should be above everybody and neutral between between people and you know, do justice fairly. But he says, I have to say that if my wife does something that is not right, I cannot punish her. But go to my wife, she is very good, she is. And he goes to wife, and wife says, no, I'm sorry, I'm not very good because I should love only my husband, but occasionally I can't 
you know, have a little uh, fancy glance at his younger brother, and so on and so forth. Until he finally gets to the, the, to the town prostitute. And she says, sir, I'm only a prostitute. All I have to do is to whoever comes, to whatever they offer, I have to say yes. That is my duty. He says, you are the noblest person because you are performing your dharma. You have a dharma and you from Now, this is a very interesting story because, in a sense, good conduct is not a matter of choice. It's a matter of assignment. And therefore, the idea that there is, that you choose to be good or you not choose to be good, is not there. Now, if you add to that idea that there are no consequences of action, then I think we have a slightly dangerous concoction here. You know, if you give me a bribe, I'll take it. No, that's it. This is Maya. The real life is somewhere else. Your soul and my soul are not bribing each other. We are pure and we'll be perfectly all right. <laughs> Fine. So I'm, I'm suggesting that it may be that we have we have a a bedrock of uh, theories that says that actions are no consequences. The third and most popular doctrine, of course, is the Karmanyavadikara state, Mahafale Shikarachana. And that is a very interesting doctrine because it is the most, it's the one summary thing that people know about the Bhagavad Gita and about morality. And I've thought a lot about that. I think it's very interesting that that says, act without worrying about the consequences of your action. Well, you have to act. You cannot not act. You have to act. It's a positive doctrine. But do not worry about the consequence of action. Now there is a, there's a little story about this which uh, just to do with the word karma. In the Vedic times we performing yajna. And in the Vedantic times we're performing action. I won't go into that. Because when people used to commission Purohits to perform yajna, they had a list of wishes they wanted to, uh, to have uh, achieved by of a yajna. And then later on, the reaction of the Shri times against the rituals and say, no, no, karma is action. And so the idea is, do not, do not pre-presume the outcome of your action and only choose one which will help you and one which will not help you. Just act. Now, I have a sort of problem about that as well. And that is problem perhaps comes with my being an economist. And indeed, that is also the classic case of Arjuna as well. The consequences of my action may, may actually be visited upon other people, what economists call an externality. Right? If consequences of my action are likely to harm other people, should I not think about them before acting? You see, don't, don't, it's not that action only helps me or does not help me. That, life would be lovely if that's all that was happening. I didn't have to worry about other people. But lots of our actions have consumed other people. Ah, Arjun, as I said, is a classic case of this. His action is going to kill people. And therefore he's saying, hey, hang on. So, one thing I want to kind of Establish is that it may be that deep in our psyche is an idea that action either has no consequences or no consequences we can actually affect. That is the first part of the Bhagavad Gita that you know, the vast cosmos going on, you are nothing, you are a speck, and whatever you do is neither here nor there, so get on with it. You are delusional if you think you actually do anything. Or, Maya. or you do something because you have no choice. This, this is your assigned caste duty. And therefore you say, well, you know, I'm like that only. I was born to do this, therefore I do this. You know, I, I belong to the jati of uh, uh, Loteras, and therefore Loteras have to loot, so therefore I'm a Lotera. I'm a good Lotera because I loot. Like, like the prostitute thing, and I'm, I'm a good prostitute. Or, lastly, the idea that. Uh, a noble person does not think about the consequences of his action. Now, I think morality involves 
Okay, this is my definition, we may all differ. Morality involves facing up to the consequences of your action. Because somebody has to be res to take responsibility for the good or the bad that you do. And if you do something which is actually likely to cause harm, you should own up and say, Mea culpa, my, my fault, I take the consequences and therefore I am willing to suffer whatever punishment is given to me as part of it. Now, I may be wrong and I'm not what people will point out to me. But I think that we don't have a doctrine of just punishment for actions. The theory of the karma is not sufficient because the consequence of karma will mean my next birth. It's delayed consequence. And delay is long enough so that I can forget about it. Right? I'm not going to alter my karma in this life because when Joko Choga Hoga I'll be born as a, you know, as a, as a gentle, what's it called? Okay, and now, again and again I find that, uh, and as I said, I may be wrong, so, you know, please forgive me for that. Anyway, to the extent that I know, I mean, I've spent all my life in a, in another country, in another civilization, in another sort of moral culture. And I think that the, uh, to the extent I understand the Abrahamic religions, they are, they directly hold you responsible for your action. Thou shalt not kill. I mean, thou shalt not kill. No messing around. The Ten Commandments articulate, thou shalt not covet your neighbor's wife or whatever it is. You know. No. They are directly the command, their commands to say, behave yourself. I.e., it's your behavior. Now, it's not to say that there are not, 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 no, no corruption in, in Western countries and so on. But the doctrine of morality is that. That's it. Now, one more thing uh, I want to pursue. Uh, just forgive me for a minute. And that is that uh, there are certain tactics available in uh, the mythology and the religion, uh, which I would say are evasive actions. Bimal uh, Matilal, who was a very famous philosopher, is a professor at Oxford of philosophy, a little, little, little bit about this. And there's a lovely story I want to tell you, Gurjan. Uh, last is here and he's the master of the Mahabharata. So I, I beg his uh, pardon for uh, telling this story. There's a story of, and he, he, he recounts this story in an article of morality. After about the 10th or 11th day of the Mahabharata war, Yudhishthira is very angry. He goes to Arjun's camp in the evening and said, You fared us. You were supposed to be this great warrior. You were supposed to sort out this. You were going to win this war. And here we are, you know, you know, getting decimated. It's all your fault. You're, you're useless. So Arjun gets very angry with Yudhishthira. You are useless. You are the man who causes all these problems. It's your gambling. That, that. Go away, kind of thing. Then he has remorse. And Arjun has remorse. Yudhishthira is Arjun has remorse. How could I do this? It's a heinous sin, whatever it is. Great, great bad act to have insulted my older brother. And the only way out is death. I have to kill myself. Krishna says, no, there is a way out. If you praise yourself too much, it is as bad as criticizing your brother. So Arjun praises himself overly, and the issue is settled. Now, I find it a very peculiar story, that one bad act cancels another. And I also find a very peculiar story, because if Yudhishthira came to Arjun's camp and Krishna was presumably there, all Krishna had to say, that there their boy, sit down, nothing bad is happening, you will do 
you have just died and therefore, uh, you know, you will recover from this shock later on. He could have reconciled it, but he didn't do that. He could have waited. And the, the answer seems to be that it doesn't matter if you do a bad deed. As long as you do another bad deed, the other bad deed cancels or, or dominates the bad deed. Again, you see, it's a, it, it makes me, un, it's a very clever story, it makes me very uncomfortable. That here again there is a evasive action to avoid suffering the consequences of whatever you have done. Now, um, if it be the case that I have any, any, any reason for this, uh, it would be that people more or less think that there are no norms in religion which absolutely forbid any action. There's also another thing that, uh, and this is perhaps even more controversial, that the definition of liberation is entirely self-based. So throughout the Bhagavad Gita, there's absolutely not a single word that you should care for other people. Like you said about serving. Absolutely not a single word, I can tell you, I've read it. There's not a single word that says, be kind to your father, be kind to your mother, look up, you know, be, make quite sure that your locality is clean and not dirty. I'm, I'm just modernizing it. It says, if you want to attain moksha, this is what you have to do. This is the recipe for liberation. The recipe of liberation is entirely to do with the self, regardless of what kind of world you're living in. The world may be falling out, apart in, in your, uh, around you. You just concentrate on your own uh, salvation. And your salvation has nothing to do with anybody else. It's kind of hub and spoke theory. There is God and there is you in the hub and spoke relationship. And you go get into that relationship and you're right. Uh, that again may be the reason why very good people, people who are devout, people who are sort of, you know, would not hurt a fly, are quite happy to live in complete squalor around them. Because it's quality that we do with them. No part of their life. Uh, you know, it's, it just happens to be there. And it's just... Now, if these various things that I have kind of thought about and picked up, sort of unsystematically, I find it, then I do believe that either we say, either you will tell me this is not true, or you will say, yes, but people can still rise above it. After all, as uh, His Excellency Mr. Raskolkar said, we have had good behavior in the past. And it's, it's not we have had well-behaved people in the past, especially the first few years after independence. They are probably still imbued by some different morality. Uh, and we may have had some kind of a temporary aberration. But I do, I do feel that there is uh, there is a, a problem uh, about our behavior that uh, people do things, they are caught doing things which are not supposed to be done. Uh, they deny until finally you have to carry out a legal case and they deny and deny, escape and consequences until, as I said, finally the process comes to an end and they go to jail. I don't think a politics can live any longer like this. Because the, given the judicial delays, it is completely a, 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 a ticket for freedom to do whatever you like. But you're never going to be caught out in time. Okay, I mean, we, we, have, we have all sorts of examples I could give. Uh, that, I mean, even, even in the case of uh, Narendra Modi, happens to be a controversial subject to mention. The answer is, he has been given a clean chit. That's it. That's the end of the story. I don't want to go into whether the clean chit is clean or not, but that, that, that's neither here nor there. 
We do believe that the courts of law are the only arbiter of morality. And given the fact that the courts of law are overcrowded and underfunded and, and long delayed and so on, it really is not likely that anybody is going to be punished in any good time for anything they have done. And passing more laws is not the answer. Passing more laws only adds to the burden of the judiciary. It doesn't actually solve any problem. So some other way will have to be found in which we say, perhaps we have associations of people who decide to uh, popularize suffering the consequence of your action or something like that, that uh, or some people some take a pledge that if I am in public office, I shall take consequence of action and not, not, not be evasive and so on. After all, in the famous episode where, where Rahul Gandhi tore up the piece of paper, the government was going to pass an ordinance to let off uh, politicians who are likely to be in trouble with the courts from not having to sit in parliament. I mean, it, was, it was openly. So we, we, were, we had a whole system trying to say, no, no, don't worry, that nothing will happen if you, if you kill the consulate in parliament. So, and I think the reason why people tolerate that is that we have the idea that we are not responsible for the constant action. Okay, I think I've spoken far too much, uh, far too long, and maybe uh, not made much sense, but uh, I will just give one, one more example just to kind of provoke you a bit further. <laughs> and I've, I've, this is not, not as evasive an action as uh, before, but it uh, relates to Adi. So, you know, it's always a risky thing to do. Uh, this story about when Gandhiji gave up uh, milk. And he had a theory about how drinking cow's milk was depriving the cows of mother's milk and so on. We won't go into the details of all that, but he decided he's not going to have Then he had a severe illness. And Dr. Yuraj Mehta said that it's really not going to be feasible for you to recover, unless you have milk. And so it was decided that when he took the oath, he had not realized that goats give milk as well. And therefore, goat's milk was admissible within the terms of the oath he had taken. Now, you know, I'm, you know he's a great man. And, <laughs> but what I'm saying is it's, it's, it's the same sort of strategy of not facing up to consequences of action. And uh, it puzzles me that uh, we, have, uh, we have that sort of attitude. And I'm, you know, the philosophers among you will know about consequentialism and all that. I'm not going to talk about that. But I think that one of our problems is that we have a set of beliefs which says consequences don't matter for various reasons. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Lord Desai, Mr. Raskotra, the August audience. There's another facet of Lord Desai, perhaps, which has not been discussed this evening. And I think uh, we'll call him another day to uh, share that facet of his life as well. He says his greatest achievement in terms of writing a book, which he has written 20 of them and about some 200 essays, if I'm not wrong, is the book titled Nehru's Hero, Dilip Kumar in Life of India. This was published in 2004. I thought he would spend some time, dwell on that, and share uh, to change the debate and the discourse that was going on this evening, but perhaps another day. Uh, on behalf of the management committee of the Sri Satyasai International Center, uh, I would first like to thank the audience uh, for sparing time this evening to be with us and to be part of this dialogue. Uh, the volunteers of the SAIM organization who have managed the event. My grateful thanks to our guide, mentor, and the spirit behind the center, Sri Satyasai Baba. Last but not the least, Lord Desai, for such a lucid talk 
on a very emerging issue in our country, uh, a cause of concern for people in my generations. A lot of them are sitting in the audience today. Um, and I'm almost tempted to quote uh, uh, a quotation from Bhagwan Baba, uh, which is very topical to the subject that is being discussed today. He says, without an individual character, I think some of the audience has raised this, without individual character, there cannot be a national character. And he's also told us the solution to that problem. He says, how do you achieve the national character? How do you foster the uh, foster character in the nation? He says, end of all education is character. Uh, once again, on behalf of the management committee, I thank all of you present here. And may I now uh, take the honor of inviting Mr. Rasgotra uh, to give a short, small token of our love to Lord Desai uh, and as a token of appreciation. Brothers and sisters, please put your hands together for Lord Desai.